We'd like to welcome you to the Winter School District, and on behalf of the school board and staff, we have a special program for you that uh, we feel is, is quite unusual. Um, during the next 24 hours or so, we're going to be interviewing various veterans from World War II. These people are members of our community. Some people may speak about their husbands or wives or grandparents that have already been deceased. Um, this is an unusual opportunity in that approximately 100 veterans or more a day die in the United States. And of course, World War II was in the very early 40s, ended by 1945. And uh, that's been many years ago, so we know that uh, time is, is moving quickly. Uh, again, we welcome you to this unusual program and uh, presentation and interviews that we will be having with these veterans. John Barrett from Bruce, Wisconsin. And I attended school here in 1944. I was just a junior. I went to school in Couturier for two years. He had a two-year high there at the time. I went here one year, and I was drafted into the service at the age of 18. Uh, I was behind on my schooling because I didn't start grade school till I was eight years old, living too far from school to get there. I did skip one of my grades, I think it was the third or fourth, I'm not sure. But when I was drafted into the service at that time, when you became 18, you were, the war was on and you were go, you were go. I had basic training in Camp Stewart, Georgia in 1944 but was pulled out of, it was an artillery base, and we were learning identification of airplanes. It was a school. And they, well, I've always said they needed cannon fodder. So they pulled us all out of school before we graduated, gave us four weeks infantry training, and we were shipped overseas. I went overseas on the world's third largest ship called the Isle de France. And I could hardly believe the number of soldiers on it. There was 15,000 soldiers on it, that Isle de France. That's equal to a whole division in the infantry, 15,000. We landed in Glasgow, went down through England, and got on a cruiser in Southampton, if I remember right, um, crossed over to La Harve. The landing had been made already. D-Day was June of 44. And this was in January that I went in as, well, many of us went in as replacements. I joined the 36th Infantry Division, the 142nd Regiment, E Company. We went into combat in, it would be northwestern France, close to the Swiss border. Uh, the fighting was very, very heavy, as I remember it. The casualties were mostly wounded, of course. I think the ratio was uh, three wounded to every fatality. I was wounded in the forehead. I had lost my helmet in combat. I don't know what knocked it off, but something knocked it off. And a piece from a hand grenade, shrapnel from a hand grenade, hit me on the side of the head. I actually didn't know I was wounded until I started dripping blood. I went back to the field, uh, not the hospital, but first aid, I guess. They put a patch on it and back to the front line again. And you weren't continually fighting, you were fighting at periods of time. Uh, and the, the buddies, my buddies were kidding me about them putting the bullseye for the Germans to shoot at. Of course, I ripped it off right away. Then we made, um, 
was the 15th of March, we made a attack in Hagenau Forest, where the Germans were fortified, dug in. We crossed a large field early in the morning, it was dark yet, and I'm sure they could see us coming. They were in the woods, and when we got to the edge of the woods, they opened up on us. It was, the air was just full of bullets and shrapnel and so on and so forth. And I had dove. Luckily, there was a big tree, and I dove behind the tree. The guys were diving on top of me and everything else. And of course, the guys were getting hit, you know. Well, anyway, when we got the light, we quieted the thing down. We won that battle. Then I went. We went. We was pulled off the line and had to re uh, get more replacements because we had lost quite a few soldiers. Uh, went into combat again. Then on the 22nd of March, in we were attacking the Siegfried line in a little town by the name of Ober Otterback. The fighting was heavy there. It took us a week to capture three pillboxes. The Germans were in these fortifications up on a high hill in the forest right outside the town. Um, it was a Sunday morning and there was three left in the squad that I was in. They, we'd always call one of the last name, it would be Varick, Tucker, Jordan. Uh, we were, the three of us were PFCs. I was the acting squad leader. I had a, a black face watch on that had been GI issued so you could read it in the night. And we were to attack the pillbox right in front of us, probably uh, less than 50 yards. We were in their trench that they had dug. These trenches run from one pillbox to the next pillbox, and they were they would zigzag. You had to keep your head down. They were probably uh, three and a half, four feet trench. And you had to get to the metal door to get in with a, a heat charge. You'd pull a pin, and it would get so hot in there that from the, the fire that was going against the door that they'd have to come out. Of course you had to you had to kill a machine gunner first. There was a machine gunner on top and we had we quieted the machine gunner and we were just ready to make the attack on the pillbox with what we called the beehive when everything broke loose again they they were like counterattacking and and stuff Shrap uh, shells were landing around us and hand grenades and then everything just went blank for me and when I came to I couldn't move I was kind of paralyzed and there was dirt on me and stuff like that and well finally someone drug me into one of the one of the pillboxes we had captured and they called for there was quite a few other soldiers wounded and killed Tucker and Jordan were killed right alongside me in the same shelling. Uh, so I was actually the sole survivor in that squad, not necessarily killed, but killed and wounded, us being down to three. I was being carried out then by the American medics in the afternoon. They had given me first aid and tried to stop the bleeding. I was hit in the right thigh. I remember a piece of shrapnel sticking through my leg that they, they didn't take it out there, they left it there, but they packed gauze and stuff around it to stop the blood. They started carrying me out on a stretcher that afternoon, and the American, it was American medics that would take it, and they couldn't get around the corner. The corner of, of the trench was too sharp for the stretcher to turn. They laid me up on the bank, and when they got up to take me down, it was kind of a hilly area. I don't know if they got hit or what, but uh, I didn't see them again, and I was there quite a while laying on the stretcher, and pretty soon five or six German soldiers came over to me, 
they had a a long stick with a white flag on it, and they were waving it. They were giving up. And they picked up the stretcher with me on it, and it was it was a good feeling, even if they were the enemy, to have to know that they were uh, thinking of me too. You know, it was the end of the war for them. It was the end of the war for me. When I got into uh, Oberaderbach was the name of the town. I was put on a well, one soldier, a wounded soldier on each side of the jeep, and then to the field hospital and emergency operation there, and then the soldiers were shipped to a big hospital in France. Dijon, France was the name of the place, and I was in that hospital then recuperating from uh, the end of March to uh, the end of June or first part of July. I remember the doctor, uh, they wouldn't let me move. I was paralyzed from the waist down. They wouldn't let me move for about a month, quite a while. And penicillin had, I remember penicillin had just, I think it had just come on then, and I would get a shot of penicillin around the clock every four hours, uh, which would take away the infection and stuff. But I healed up, and the doctor was surprised how I could walk again. Uh, I do remember that when I started walking again, it was quite a chore because it was, everything was dizzy and whirling at first, and I had to sit down and take it a little at a time. But within, from the time I started walking again, I think within a week I was back to my infantry outfit, which was E Company. They were in a little town by the name of Kirschheim. In Germany, that means church home. Uh, we, they were stationed there as Army of Occupation. Uh, and they were attached. But they were training to go to Japan and to the Pacific, because there was the war was on in the Pacific yet. And at that time, they used a point system. If you had the right number of points, you didn't have to go. And I was lucky enough. I hadn't been in the military long, but I had combat points, which was five. Purple Heart was five. Oak Leaf Cluster was five. Combat Infantry Badge was five. And then it went by where you were and, and the months you were in the service, states or overseas. But my points totaled 41. 40 was a break-off point. And we, we were in the CP talking with the company commander. And they wanted to, a lot of replacements were coming in from the states and then the high point men with 100 points or more, they were going home. They, zim, home they go. There was probably, I have a picture of it in here. Probably 12, you know, we call them old timers left out of that Texas outfit. The rest were home or being sent home. But anyway, I, they were gonna promote me to a squad leader and I turned it down because I had enough points to go home. I told them no, I had enough of this. I didn't want to go to the Pacific. So they rotated me in then, they ro rotated me into the 1st Armored Division, and they were stationed in Esslingen, Esslingen, Germany. But their orders got changed, and they were going to go to the Pacific, so I rotated out of there to Bremerhaven, Germany, and I was a military policeman, in the military police then for, it was a military police outfit from well, let me see, from fall till May when they came home. I came home in May. And I was honorably discharged out of Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. Today it's called Fort McCoy. Uh, they, I don't know why they changed the name. It's the same way with Camp Stewart, where I took my basic training in the AAA, uh, part of my basic training. That's now called Fort Stewart. They changed the name of it from Camp to Fort, same way with McCoy. Kind of, kind of strange, but 
things change as time goes on. Uh, I was very fortunate to survive, I feel, because of the severe fighting that went on at that time. And one of the bad things for me was I had, my father is from Germany, from Flensburg, Germany. He came to this country and to the United States in 1912, before World War I. And I have many relatives in Germany, uncles, aunts, cousins. They were on, you know, on the German side. I was on the American side. I was fighting them. And quite a few of them got killed right in the area where I was. Uh, I never got to see him or anything. I mean, there was, as a matter of fact, you didn't even mention that that you were German or you were, a lot of, a lot of hard feelings going on and stuff like that, which, uh, I don't know, that, that shouldn't have been, but that's the way it was. Uh, so. We got to stop. I'll go. And this, this is my, now I was attached to the Bonham Richard, that's what's up here. Mm -hmm. And the Bonham Richard, that's a, was an Essex carrier, that's one of the bigger ships in the fleet, 2,700 men on it. And this is, but I was attached to the, to the fighter squadron. That we were the first night, night aircraft squadron in the fleet. And the uh, collectors I have my, my, my document. This I here. received from, I got maybe other veterans too received it from Harry, S. Harry Truman. He was President of the United States, and he is the one that dropped the, that made the, give the orders to drop the atomic bomb. And we were just off the coast of Japan when they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Now, you can do what you want to. This was before I went overseas. My name is, going with D, Joe McLean. Joe is my nickname. Everybody knows me by the name of Joe. And when I was in the service, they called me Mac. I was, <coughs> in 1942, a, a proceeding going in the service, I was working for Bendix Radio Corporation in Baltimore, Maryland. So I <coughs> decided to, in 1942, I decided to enter the service. Uh, I enlisted. I was not drafted, and I, because I had, was working for an aviation uh, corporation in civilian life. They assigned me to uh, Naval Air in Jacksonville, Florida. So I went through uh, training and what they call boot camp in Jacksonville, Florida. And after going to a boot camp in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, I was uh, sent to Naval Air Station in Melbourne, Florida, where I went to in, in instrument training and instruction. And uh, after completing that course, I taught a link trainer, which was simulated flying for uh, several uh, months. And uh, then from there I went to uh, gunnery uh, simulated instruction in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C. they went through some, uh, these are simula simulators for fighter squadron. Uh, after that I re returned to Melbourne and Naval Air Station. And after a few more months, um, maybe five or six, I was sent to special training at uh, Chicago Naval Air, Naval Trek Tech Training in Chicago. And after that, uh, graduating from that, I went back to my home base again, which was uh, Naval Air Station in Melbourne, Florida. And after being in Melbourne, Florida for about two years, or I mean, pardon me, not two years, two months, uh, it's a tradition in the Navy that after you have had two years of shore duty that you have to go to sea, and so I had already two years at land duty, so I was <coughs> getting
gave, given orders to report to uh, Naval Air Station in Barbers Point, Hawaii, after being in Hawaii for about three months, uh, the aircraft carrier US, USS Bonham Richard and namesake of John Paul Jones had um, came into Pearl Harbor and they were having uh, some problems with the uh, personnel that was spoken the man the uh, one that was in charge of uh, automatic pilots and so I was a, the uh, my officer called me in and told me that I would probably have to go aboard ship and so after a week I went aboard the USS aircraft carrier Bonham Richard with the a fighter squadron equipped with uh, radar bulbs. This was the first uh, night aircraft carrier and the first fleet of fighter planes uh, that were flying uh, nuisance raids over Japan. And uh, I was in, uh, in the instrument squadron on the, in the uh, SF, F6S squadron. And uh, from then I was in that all during the rest of the, the war. And I was off, the, we were off the coast of Japan uh, when they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And after uh, I was in the fleet when the uh, uh, Japanese surrendered and the uh, surrender was uh, signed by uh, General Douglas MacArthur uh, aboard the, uh, and I think Admiral Lemus aboard the uh, USS uh, Missouri, which was the flagship of the fleet at that time. After that, I um, we, we picked up the 6th Marine Division in Guam and brought them back uh, to the United States. And from there, I um, was was to be discharged, and they sent me to Great Lakes Air Station or in Illinois to be discharged. But they discharged us based on a, a point system. If you had so many points, if you had a dependent like a mother or a father or children, you got so many points for that. I was single at the time, therefore I was the last one to be, uh, would be the last one to be discharged because I was single, I wouldn't have enough points. So they gave me the, a uh, job of uh, transporting, uh, transporting uh, new recruits to San Diego and I did that for uh, about a month, and then I, I was uh, discharged and returned home, and I came back to uh, winter uh, after being discharged. Henry P. Martin, and I live here in winter. Uh, I graduated from Winter High School in 1939. And there's quite a few of my classmates around here yet, so. Uh, uh, I served in uh, North Africa, Italy, and France. And my, my outfit went on further into Germany, but I left because I was uh, I was sick and they sent me home. I had combat fatigue. Uh, in training, I uh, I served in Texas, Oklahoma, and uh, Louisiana. And I I was wounded in Italy. I got a purple heart for it. And uh, and uh, <coughs> we had some tough times and some pleasant ones. All 
was in the service about two years and four months or something like that. Then I was discharged from, from the States in the hospital. So I wasn't in till the end of the war. But
then they liberated St. Di. Germany, the Battle of the Bulge and the Army of Occupation. The, the unit built 67, 90 feet, 67, 90 feet of bridge under combat conditions. Uh, it started out, the unit was, the unit was mostly uh, Wisconsin and Northern Michigan. And, uh, then as the fellows left, why they brought in other replacements. But, uh, we had some rough times, but there was uh, Some of these things, we the only memories I've had. My name is Raymond Grice, and I was at Iron Winter. It, well, I was drafted in the service on November 21st, 1943, and I served two years in the Marine Corps from November 43 to December 45. I received my boot camp training for six weeks at Oceanside, California. While I was still there, my wife was allowed to come out there for two weeks uh, prior to my going overseas. So we lived near the base at that time. She then went back home, and my company went by ship as we sought, fought on the Pacific side known as the Pacific Theater of War. We headed for the Mariana Islands to fight the enemy, and we fought at Saipan and Tinian. That was the Mariana Islands. And Iwo Jima, which was a volcano island, I became a driver on the amphibian tractor that, which took our Marines to and from the island. These tractors went on land as well as on sea. One of the islands, Iwo Jima, was a very small one, which measured about three miles by five miles. There were many casualties there, and I felt so very fortunate to survive the war. When, we, when I got word that the war was over, we all rejoiced and thanked our Lord for all his blessings. Oh, yeah. years old and I had a bad stroke but I went in the Navy when I was 17 years old and I fought the Japanese for four years and uh, I, got, I got a I got four uh, stars four medals and uh, we we hit a submarine and we had their depth, depth charges and uh, we only had, we had 40 and 39, uh, the, the other one was no good, so the submarine come right out of the water and uh, we hit it and it went down again and uh, then it come back about uh, 10 minutes later in a, in a, like this and we hit it again and it turned over and it sunk and uh, we knew it was gone. There was oil and all that stuff fell right out of the water and uh, then I was up in, uh, I was the first boat that was up in, in, uh, in Guadalcanal and uh, we were sweeping in there to see if there any bombs in there and uh, so the the Japanese was out there having their their breakfast, and uh, the army guys they they went right in there and they run, and it was uh, about 18 months before they really got them out of there, but uh, it was awful bad there and then, and I I was uh, I was in that uh, boat for seven months before I could see the go into the land. And we'd fill up with uh, we'd fill up with uh, oil and uh, I got our food the way we went. And uh, so I never did get my mail till I got the mail, my, my grandmother, she uh, died six months before I even knew about it. And 
then when uh, the Japanese uh, uh, surrendered, because we, we went right back when the, we was sweeping and we were going to go right into the Japanese and uh, they surrendered because of a big bomb. The second bomb, they surrendered. So the lieutenant told me I could go uh, back to, to uh, get out of the Navy and uh, they wanted me to keep that, stay there, but I wouldn't. And uh, then, then uh, the lieutenant told me, he said, well, he said, we're going up into, into China. So what I did, I went up into China and stayed there six weeks up in Shanghai. And uh, then I, I got on another tanker and got out of there. I went down to San Diego and, and I got out of the Navy altogether. Figured I was going to get drafted on April 40, uh, 43. I volunteered. And I had uh, reported to Camp Grant in Illinois. Then I went for basic training in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I could uh, found out I could take a test to get into Air Cadet, so I took the test and uh, left Atlantic City and went over to Williamsport for, they called it, uh, uh, Air Students, and we had schooling there. You want everything? Or? Yes. Yeah. So then I went from there, I, I waited around after uh, I got out of uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I went. Uh, I went to uh, uh, somewhere in Kentucky, and from there uh, I went to uh, like a gunnery school out in Las Vegas, Nevada, and from there over to Cal Santa Ana, California, for uh, cadet training. And after. A, Two, three months there, I went over to Carlsbad, New, Me New Mexico, where I was classified as bombardier. Then I went to bombardier school. From there, I went on a short leave and uh, came back in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, and met up with the crew that I was to fly with on a B-17. And we, we uh, went down to uh, El Paso, Texas for training. That was for about a month. We'd fly, like on make-believe missions and stuff like that. <clears throat> and from there, when we finished that and we're ready for to go overseas, we went to uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and waited to, uh, to ship out to England. And uh, we went on the Ile de France, a boat. It took about seven days. I don't know why it took that long with the zigzag and stuff like that. And I, when we landed in England, I was assigned to uh, the 92nd Bomb Group in uh, Pottington, England. And from there, I flew 25 missions, and the war ended right near the end of that, and uh, came back home. Waited around in Midland, Texas, for till Japan surrendered in August. Then another month. And then I was sent back home for a while, and then I got discharged from Truex Field in Madison. My name is John Donahue. Uh, most people call me Jim. I'm going to... I wrote down what I wanted to say. I hope you don't mind if I read it, because otherwise I'll forget half of it. I am going to talk about World War II airplanes. There were no jets in those days. They were propeller driven, but they were pretty fast. They would cruise along about 400 miles per hour. There were bombers and fighters. I was a fighter pilot out in the Pacific Islands. Fighters are smaller than bombers and more maneuverable, and they have only one person in them. Fighters have from five to eight machine guns firing forward. You can't aim the guns, you have to aim the airplane. Fighters were used to escort bombers and protect them on raids on enemy held islands and to protect our own island from enemy bombers. I had over 100 hours of combat flying time. Some of our missions were to 
enemy islands seven or eight hundred miles away, and of course you had to make the return trip. I shot down one Japanese fighter and helped shoot down a bomber and another fighter, besides strafing enemy positions on the ground. Fighters <coughs> had a movie camera mounted on the wing, and when you pressed the triggers to fire the guns, the cameras started and took pictures of what you were aiming at. I flew jet fighters for two years in the Air Force Reserve after the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do this, but get, get this front, 103rd Division, and then turn the page. It showed all the places we were over in Europe. Let's see, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak for the veterans, you know, but uh, I had a problem because uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to say because in such a short time I wanted to be something important. And uh, so I was, uh, the more I thought about it, the more confused I got. And a little girl from fourth grade, her name is uh, Brandy, Brandis, Brandy. I think, and she uh, sent me a letter. And then after I read her letter, I knew what was important, and it was uh, freedom, the importance of freedom in this country it enables the, all the kids to go to school and uh, get an education, get married and have a family. <coughs> but uh, this, is, I think, is the most important of all because uh, wars are a terrible thing and nobody wins because there's young boys on both sides that get killed and the hospitals are full of uh, veterans with their legs and arms blown off, you know, and those people all did that so that we would have our freedom. And as you get older, uh, there's going to be some, you're going to hear some people that will complain about the country, but always remember that uh, there's, must, uh, there's things wrong with our country, but uh, it's a lot better than uh, any other countries in the world because we we fought Hitler and Mussolini and those dictators over there and they wanted to take away our freedom and make slaves out of us and there's a lot of gruesome things that they did and, and don't pay to go into too much of that but we uh, as a veteran I was in the infantry and we I did help uh, free a lot of people in the concentration camps. I even found one woman one time, I went in an old building to see if uh, there was any snipers in there, and this woman was living in a bathtub for three or four days with no food, no water, and I gave her a drink out of my canteen, and I took her down to a field kitchen, and the cooks all fed her, put some clothes on her, and I had to leave, and I never did see her again. But it, it, it's not that I'm bragging, because all the other soldiers did the same thing, you know. And this is what people should remember, what they went through especially, that they had this freedom. And I made a few notes here and things that I'm very forgetful like I suppose everybody else, but I made a few notes here on things to remember. Oh yes, this is one that the kids today should remember, that if we ever had another war, God forbid, but uh, you have to experience rationing. You can't just go down to the co-op and buy groceries like it used to be. You might have to wait till Friday to get a pound of hamburger. And <coughs> in the, the, the women, the mothers and the sisters and the daughters and the older folks worked in the factories night and day uh, building war machineries, tanks, guns trucks, jeeps, and those factories were lit up at night and they were working 
24 hours a day. And this is what their mothers did. And everybody chipped in. Everybody did that. And they even had, especially in the city, they had gardens, any place they could find a piece of property. Maybe uh, next to a, a bank, if there's a piece of property, they put a garden in it. Or next to a, a, a car lot, if there's a piece of property, they put a garden in They called them, uh, uh, what was it they called them, I think? Uh, they called them... Uh, Some kind of garden. Victory. Huh? Victory? Victory Gardens. I couldn't think of the name. <laughs> That's what it was. And then, of course, they put flags up there and stars for the men that they had in the service. And <clears throat> it would be nothing to see a, a great big garden alongside a Kmart's, you know. And that was just some of the stuff that they had to do. But I'll give you a good example. Maybe. Uh, Say uh, a, a, a few of the kids wanted to go to uh, Ojibwa here and go down because they got a carnival going, maybe some yard sales. So they get on their bikes and they drive down as far as 70, Highway 70, and then all of a sudden when they get there, there's a big roadblock with a bunch of soldiers carrying guns and a bayonet. And they'll say, where do you think you're going? Oh, we're going to Ojibwa. You got a permit? from the governor or from the uh, mayor or the police department. Oh no, we don't have anything like that. Well, you're not going to go and don't come back here without one, otherwise you'll be shot. That's how bad it really was. And this was in all the countries over there, like uh, Normandy, uh, in Brussels, in France, and all over, and in Germany. And this is... Uh, how bad it was. And that's just a, a, an example. So uh, I don't know what else to say other than <coughs> it don't pay to get into them gruesome things because you see on television what went on in those uh, concentration camps. And uh, we rode tanks and we broke through to some of them to get those people out. And some people were so starved they couldn't even come out of the barracks. We had to go in and carry them out and feed them. And this is the way the German people were, you know. So uh, I guess that's about it, other than uh, I goofed off a lot over there. I, I'll admit that, and so there's a lot of other guys, you know. There's, I could have done more. I, I feel like I could have done more. But uh, a lot of times I, I think I done things not realizing uh, that it did do some good. One time I was in a building and uh, it was snowy now, cold and we were out of ammunition. And uh, there was a couple of Germans come running to the building because we were in trouble then. And I had one of my buddies with me and he said, boy, we better do something and we're in trouble now. Well, I couldn't think of anything else, but I had a can of beans, and I threw that out, and they thought it was a hand grenade. So uh, I got to thinking afterwards, you know, really, uh, that wasn't so stupid, but it, uh, I did do some good. But I learned to speak German, too. I, I just seemed to be able to fit in with the German language good. And I think I saved other lives by uh, being able to speak German, talk myself out of trouble. And like I say, all the other soldiers done the same thing. It isn't a case of bragging. They, when when they had to do something to to, they, to help and save things and do, uh, they uh, they just the American soldier did it. That's all, you know. So uh, any other veterans know that I'm just talking about how it was, you know. It's an adventure in a lot of ways, but uh, you get over there, it's, it, you know, it's pretty rough until it was over with, you know. But uh, I appreciate Brenda in this little letter. I'll always keep that. And she was the one that put in this letter here that I should talk, more or less talk about freedom. That's what counts. And like I say, the veteran hospitals are full of boys, the, hall, the halls are full of wheelchairs all the time with, with boys uh, with their legs and arms, and people forget that, and, and that's true.
Uh, sure, they don't. They don't realize. I do too. Even. I don't think I would uh, take it as serious as I do. But I have to go in, like maybe every three or four months for a physical, and then I see it, and it slows me down a little bit and makes me appreciate what I got. You know. So I guess that's about it. Other than I can I can tell a lot of stories, but what what I'm over there, but. Uh, See, I think there was one other one here I wanted to tell you, I forgot what it was, because I'm pretty forgetful like everybody else is born. But it was nothing for me to open up a, a, a box of K-rations over there, and like maybe your mother would put her initials on it, you know. That's the way the people pitched in together. and. Uh, we we had everything, and the people here, uh, they were, they, there was, everything was rationed. Either it wasn't rationed, you just couldn't buy it, you know. Well, that's about it, so that I think that, uh, <coughs> well, uh, like Gloria Lynn suggested here, the USO, when that started, the Hollywood actors, they used to sell those war bonds, you know, which uh, uh, really made a lot of difference in the money department because they were getting a, get a, lot, of, getting a lot of money that was coming in. But uh, it, was, it was a concentrated effort by everybody. It's really, but uh, that's about all I can say other than just to maybe go through all the uh, everyday things and that was just, you know one thing I always did remember too, am I running too much time? No, no, that's fine. Uh, one thing I always did remember, we were pushing into Germany, I hadn't had a bath for a month for a month and a half, and I hadn't eaten nothing but K-ration for maybe a month and a half, and I looked like a bum, I was dirty like everybody else, but here we're driving into Germany, and all of a sudden a couple of big trucks come with all our duffel bags on, so they told us that we have to put all our dress uniforms on, and they gave us a big bottle of kerosene, and we polished our helmets, and then we polished our boots and put our dress uniforms on, which were wool. And the weather was about 90 degrees. And then the German soldiers, like I say, looked like a bunch of hobos. And they saw us coming, all dressed up like a brand new army. Now, I don't know what general ever thought of that, but can you imagine not having a bath for a month or two and putting on wool clothes at 90 degrees and trying to make an impression on the journalists of why they were laying their guns down faster and we could pick them up. And this is the truth. This is what happened. And I still didn't get a bath after we took them off. <laughs> well, that's just some of the stories that went on. We had a lot of good officers over there and I went over with maybe 180 men, and out of the 180, 30 came back, you know, and that's how bad it was, you know. So, I guess it's, I, what I'm trying to get across is that people know what they went through, and just because it happened 40, 50 years ago, that's, you don't forget it. Because I always figured a soldier is not dead until he's forgotten, you know? And that's the way I leave it. So thank you for your time. Yep. And forth in this, mm -hmm. I don't know if they can read that, is a human flag. And this is, this is Japan. Yeah, that's it. Because okay. I can never remember what he was. Would you My name is Margaret Steiner. My husband 
Duane served in the U.S. Navy. He uh, enlisted when he was in high school and had to wait till he graduated, so he was 18 years old and he went in uh, a week after graduation. He got his training at Great Lakes, and uh, the only thing I remember about that is how he was so disgusted because he had to uh, spend his free time learning how to swim because he didn't know how to swim. And they just push you off of a high diving board and third time you go down, they get you up and then you had, he had to go spend his nights learning how to swim. He was uh, on the USS Atlanta and he made uh, two, I don't know whether you called them trips or what you called them, and uh, he was in for the occupation of Japan. So his, uh, he was on a cruiser. He was a fire controlman third class, so he shot some of the big guns that were on the uh, ship. And um, can I stop for a minute? Okay. Just stop it for a minute. Uh, this is a picture of the ship, and you can see all the guns that are on it. It's called a cruiser, and uh, I know they went in a big uh, fleet and so on. And he, when they went into Japan and occupied it, I remember him telling how they, uh, the Japanese would spit at them because they were very resentful, of course, of them coming in their country. And he was in the, he has medals for the Asiatic Pacific area, China area, and the occupation of Japan area. Uh, he was always very proud of being in the Navy and uh, thought it was a good way of life for him. And as a young man, just 18 years old, I think it really is good training. And I know he always would tell about how they had to keep the ships so clean and how they were, they seemed to spend a lot of their time when they weren't fighting, painting things and uh, scrubbing all the time. And I was, at the time, my only part, part I remember most about the war was being on rationing and uh, making a lot of bandages and doing a lot of things for Red Cross. I was teaching school at the time because I was older than Dwayne and uh, I, I remember that when I was teaching in Marion, Wisconsin in 1942, that the seniors there were all waiting for graduation so they could go into the war too. And we bought, the, through war bonds, uh, um, well, what would you call it, one of these little jeeps like that they used and we paid for it by selling war bonds in the school, and then the, they brought it to school so we could see it. So those are, I guess, are my main memories of the war. See you in a little bit. Mm
brought it up onto the shore. The island, when we went in there, was about a half a mile long and a quarter of a mile wide. We dredged it up to about a mile and a half long and a half a mile or a little bit better, three quarters of a mile probably wide. And it, it made a big uh, submarine base and a large airport. Also an uh, airport for seaplanes. And then from there we went back to the Hawaiian Islands for a couple of weeks and from there we were shipped out to the Philippines. We hit a couple smaller islands on the way. But I uh, ended up on uh, Samar. And uh, we were there, actually we were on Samar up until the last of the war. And we built up a large uh, uh, hospital. We had to take the trees down in the mountains, fill in the ravine, and build a hospital up on in the mountains. And uh, we no sooner got it where part of it could be inhabited, and there was a naval battle. I believe it was 460 burnt Navy men brought in. And after that, uh, things got a little bit quieter. Well, uh, no, my name is Robert City. I was in the Army Medical Corps, in World War II, from 1943 until 1946. I took basic training at Fitzsimmons General Hospital in Denver, Colorado. I went to duty there. I worked at the Post Guard House. I could do typing at that time. I was the Post Guard House clerk. I did the paperwork, the typing and so forth, all the forms you had to fill out. Uh, I did that for some time and then they sent me to, the Army sent me to medical school at Fitzsimmons. I went to medical school for nine months. Uh, I graduated. I have a diploma at home. They turned me to duty to Fitzsimmons General Hospital itself. I worked there for a while. I, my medical schooling, I got to be what the Army uh, considered me to be, a surgical technician. So I worked at different hospitals, but I worked in the operating rooms. I worked at Fitzsimmons, I worked at Madigan General, I worked at Mountaineer Ordnance Depot, which is not a hospital, it was an infirmary deal. Uh, and I worked at Fort Douglas, Utah. I was discharged in Fort Douglas, Utah in 1946. I went back to my same old job in Minnesota. I went from the state of Minnesota when I was drafted. I stayed there until 1940. Nine. I bought the old farm out north where I was raised and I live here yet today. I guess that's about all I can tell you. I don't know what else you want to know. Um, did you have something in that book? That well, I, yeah, I, this is a picture of the of the hospital where I work. Hmm. This is the school area where I went to school. And I don't know what building I was in, I couldn't tell you, but I was in one of those buildings. These are wooden structures. I would assume that they're all gone now today. Now this is brick and cement and so forth. This is a permanent structure. <coughs> this is no longer an Army General Hospital, but uh, it is still a medical installation. It's used by private concerns of some kind. I don't know what. Yeah. And all Army general hospitals in the States are named after a certain person, generally a, a some person who was killed in service. Uh, well, Fitzsimmons was. 
Madigan was. Uh, oh, there's some more of them. I can't remember all of them. But this was a wonderful place. If they'd left me there, I'd put 30 years in service. But they didn't leave me there. <laughs> well, Seaman First Class U.S. Coast Guard. I uh, was in. Uh, I went in in '42, and uh, I served up through March of '46. And uh, I was <coughs> in the states for just about two years, and uh, in in different locations. And then I uh, went uh, to Treasure Island, shipped out to that's in California shipped out on the USS Pocomo, which is a seaplane tender, and I caught that over to uh, Pearl Harbor, and, <coughs> and then I got my regular uh, boat there, it was the AKA 123 USS Mencar, and I was on that for uh, better than a year, and we just, uh, we hauled around gear, and uh, that was units that were set up to guide planes in the bomb different areas, and uh, then we uh, we had to unload these on, on three different islands. One each unit belonged to three different islands, so uh, in order to work right. And uh, so then we that's basically what we did. We uh, got to most of the islands. Uh, we Iwo Jima, there was some uh, little fighting there yet when we got there, uh, not that much. Okinawa, we got into some. We shot a, a uh, suicide uh, bomber down at, uh, in Okinawa that was coming right at us. And it was him or us, and so our guns were fortunate to get him, so. And We got a lot. We got a lot of traveling out of it, and uh, saw a lot of water, a lot of whales, a lot of. We were in a uh, convoy one time going in the Okinawa. And we was attacked by. I don't know if two subs is what they figured, and, uh, and uh, the uh, the escorts, destroyer escorts. And, uh, got one of them, the other one got away. But uh, they told us later, and uh, debris and that came up, and they said, well, they got one, but they, they must have messed the other one, so. And then we come back to the States. We had three different uh, typhoons that we uh, was uh, kind of involved with. <laughs> One took us a uh, four-day trip, took us nine days to get where we were going because we were trying to get around, outrun it or get around it, and uh, we couldn't. So it took us nine days in that one. And uh, it took ships right up on dry land, broke them right in half. Uh, and uh, lumber and debris all over the place. Uh, that's about all that. Uh, oh, there's some interesting tales, but I don't think I'd better tell them. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if there's any uh, anything else you. Uh, that that's just the my the ship I was on and the and the crew that uh, was on part of the time. I'm Lillian Robinson. My husband, James Robinson, was in the service. He entered the service in 1945 at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. He took his basic training at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and was squadron leader and specialty qualified in rifleman. 
war ended while he was at Fort McClellan, was then sent to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, where he completed the enlisted correctional personnel course, gave instructions in mess management and cooking and baking to enlisted men and officers, also was mess sergeant for complete organization at Pine Camp, New York, and was given an honorable discharge in August of 1946. Decorations was a Victory Medal, American Theater Medal, and Good Conduct Medal. It was a very different world at that time. The country was extremely patriotic, and the soldiers were transported by train from one place to another, from home leave to back to their base or whatever, and whenever the train stopped, it was met by people with sandwiches and coffee, Kool-Aid, and cake and cookies, and they were just treated royally because they were serving their country and the people really appreciated it. And the town, Anniston, Alabama was the town closest to Fort McClellan, and the dress code was even, no shorts were allowed on the streets at that time, and people had to dress very modestly. Yet at the camp, uh, where they had a swimming pool and recreation, they were allowed to dress casually. They didn't have to follow the town. And the African American or the colored were uh, separated at that time, and they could only sit in the back of the buses. You'd get in the bus, and if there was no place to sit in the back, then they had to stand. And the white people would never, were never allowed to go back and sit for the, with the colored people. They had to stay to, for the front of the bus. And in um, the washrooms and uh, drinking fountains and all of those places were separated. They were not allowed to mingle with the whites. And it was very different than what it is today. I was in Anniston when the war ended and for the, when the Japanese surrendered. And it was a very emotional time. The whole town whistles blew and, and people were just ecstatic. The streets were just full. The American, the soldiers were confined to base because, but all the uh, workers were given a holiday after that, um, a day off from work. And uh, it was, it was really a very emotional time. And then after that, the rules were relaxed a little bit. And then there was um, more um, everyday living. They just didn't have to be quite so um, spit and polish, as they call it. And it was um, then my husband, after uh, he left there, then he served in different capacities in different camps with his um, with his um, cooking and, and uh, overseeing of mess halls wherever whatever camp he happened to be at and sometimes he even uh, was on a train that they would transport prisoners the pine camp in new york as i understand it was a, a prison camp a correctional camp and uh, they had all kinds of, of people there. They weren't uh, our foreign prisoners. They were the prisoners, I think, of, of the army, like a um, brig. And uh, it was it was a very interesting time to live. And I think that uh, it's too bad we still don't have some of the patriotism that they had then. But a war brings out. Uh, bringing together of people mm -hmm. as much as we dislike to see it. Go ahead. Well, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Teresa Blue, and I am here to introduce my husband, Alfred, 
who was a World War II veteran. Alfred served in the Navy for over two years. He went into boot camp in October of 43 at the Great Lakes Naval Training Center. He served there for eight weeks and afterward he went to Navy Pier where he started into naval aviation and conducted from there on. He led all through schools for uh, naval aviation. He wound up being a flight engineer and an aviation machinist mate in the Navy. He flew in a plane that was called a PV-2. The main job for this crew was to fly over the coastlines looking for enemy submarines, warships, uh, aircraft carriers, and they were there to protect our country from our enemy. I'm very proud to say that I think he is one of the greatest veterans and I take my hat off to all veterans because I think you all did a special job. Thank you and God bless you all. In 1941, when the war, uh, war broke out, I was married and had two children. I worked in a defense plant. I transferred to another one and I was called up for service in 43. I joined the Navy, but I was colorblind. So I had to be an amphibious force. So I went through my base, basic training. And I uh, came home for 30 days and took a train to Los, Los Angeles, got on a Liberty ship and went to Guadalcanal. And being colorblind, I had to be an amphibious force. And so I got assigned to the LSC 460. And, uh, and I took the advice of the uh, fellow I met out there that his ship got sunk or got hit. And he told me the best advice that he had was just do your duty and uh, don't uh, volunteer for any more than you have to because what happened on his ship one of his buddies wanted to go over to the other side of the ship with, the, with his buddy and the, and the gun station. And uh, that's where he got hit. And they, they both got killed. So I took his advice and uh, I did my duty. And uh, I came out of them alive. And we got sunk in December 20, December 2nd, 1944 in the Philippines on our second, second trip to Mandora. First trip we had all kinds of protection. Second day, of the second trip we only had one destroyer with us. And that's when they hit And the sh ship in front of us and and ours got sunk, and we lost six officers. We got sunk by a chap suicide plane. Three of them came down at the same time. And sunk the one in front of us, sunk us, and missed the one behind us. One behind us picked me up, and that's what saved my life. And uh, I was. When that plane hit, I was lucky I got thrown on the deck and I was I'm face down and shrapnel all went through my back into my back instead of through my eyes. And I was transferred from the, the ship to pick me up to the hospital ship. And then I went to, uh, I woke up or came to it, Hawaii in a hospital. I was in there for Oh, about six weeks, and then I was discharged out of the hospital. And with my luck, I came up, came back on an LST. Took us 11 days to come back from Hawaii. I came home for a 30-day leave. Went back to Great Lakes, and was transferred to Newport, Rhode Island. 
come to find out they were going to ship me back over to Germany. I went into a hospital to get a physical before I was shipped out, and they found out I wasn't capable. I wasn't in shape. They gave me an honorable discharge of the 80% disability and I was sent home and uh, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, <coughs> I'm uh, Howard Hilden. I live here in, uh, in the village of Winter. I moved to the uh, Winter area in 1973 and have stayed here ever since. I originally practiced law in Madison, Wisconsin and opened an office here until my I retired. Um, well, I served in the uh, United States Navy and uh, during World War II. Uh, I entered the service at the tender age of 17 with my uh, father's permission, <coughs> and uh, uh, which would have been in 1943. Um, I had my basic training at um, Great Lakes Naval Training Station. Um, Subsequently, was uh, uh, I volunteered for the um, um, submarine sc school. Unfortunately, the day before I was supposed to go, I uh, contracted a case of mumps, <laughs> and uh, I missed my draft. Um, and then I was uh, shipped to the west coast uh, and left uh, for the uh, Southwest Pacific on board a. Uh, a merchant vessel as part of the Navy contingent. Uh, the uh, name of that ship was the MV Day Star. Unfortunately, at that time there was segregation in the service, and uh, most of the the, uh, the troops that were carried were colored, and the uh, ship's crew was basically Navy. Uh, the uh, trip, uh, we had we had absolutely no idea where we were going because we were in the enlisted men, <laughs> enlisted men <coughs> who were never supposed to know anything. Uh, and some 30 days later, I ended up in uh, Milne Bay, um, New Guinea, uh, which would be about the southern tip of uh, of New Guinea. On the way. Uh, some just few days before arriving there, one uh, one of the crew members uh, spotted the periscope, and uh, the word immediately spread the, uh, that we were being followed. And I don't know how true it was, except I uh, observed that we started moving quite a bit faster and, and a lot more of zigzagging. Uh, after we had entered the Bay of Milne Bay, uh, uh, quite far out in the ocean, we saw a big pall of black smoke, and the word came out uh, that a um, tanker had been torpedoed. So it is possible we were pursued by a submarine. Um, I stayed on uh, land there a couple weeks, and then was trans uh, moved to a uh, my <coughs> last ship, which was a named the USS Oglala. Um, this ship was about 600 feet long and had personnel of about some over 500. And I was um, in the electrical gang working below deck. As that's been my, uh, <coughs> been my training. Um, this ship uh, looked like a uh, had beautiful lines and looked like a, a great warship, but actually it wasn't. It was a emergency repair vessel. Uh, we did carry armament, uh, which consisted of uh, a couple of five and a half inch uh, guns and a few three inch guns, some batteries of 40 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft and 20 millimeter aircraft. <coughs> Um, 
soon, soon we moved up the coast and ended up in Hollandia, uh, New Guinea. Uh, now that was a, a, a narrow inlet with a rather big bay with um, big hills or mountains surrounding it. I remember the tremendous heat and humidity, constant, um, and, and heavy uh, downpour and rain. The uh, below deck people had to contend with temperatures of close to 140, 40 degrees. The only thing that kept them alive was um, big fans and blowers. Uh, at that at that time, the um, the liberal or the uh, army was ha was doing most of the land fighting on New Guinea, moving steadily up the uh, coastline uh, towards the northern end of uh, on the northwest end of uh, New Guinea. And, uh, at that time, uh, the uh, Uh, aircraft that the Japanese had were fairly well non-existent because they'd simply been sh shot down by superior uh, uh, American fighters. We'd see that we'd see them periodically, but maybe once or twice a Japanese plane. <coughs> um, so I say we were not considered really a combat combat ship, uh, except that we carried our own armament. <coughs> well, I stayed there a considerable period of time, and uh, when the uh, uh, MacArthur uh, made his move on the, uh, the Philippine Islands, we were on, <coughs> on our way, but again, we're, we were not in the combat group, which is handled uh, and by uh, the uh, combat vessels, which were basically cruisers, uh, destroyers, uh, battleships, and and, car and carriers. Uh, I did not uh, really see the, uh, uh, the the big battle that took place in the uh, uh, battle of the so-called Battle of Leyte Gulf, or sometimes called the Battle of Samar, but we were on the outskirts coming in. And uh, <coughs> uh, but we certainly saw evidence uh, of the tremendous damage done by the Japanese forces with their they had battleships with 18 18 inch uh, guns. Our biggest were 16 inch. Uh, the uh, it's just kind of an unusual story that was connected with that and that. Was Admiral Bull Halsey got lured into uh, moving the main uh, American forces of, of battleships and carriers uh, north of where uh, the Japanese forces actually were coming in. They came in in a two-pronged attack, one through the uh, Straits of um, Surigao, which was below Leyte, and another through, I believe it was called the San Bernard, uh, Bernardino Straits, which were north, and they were intentless to come in in a two-pronged attack, and had they succeeded, they would have blown uh, our ships completely out of the water. Um, I have since found out by reading and, and uh, that the, uh, they failed to have good commu communications and uh, um, basically the battle there was won by uh, um, the, what they call pup carriers. Now they were very thin skinned. They were small carriers and probably carried about 30 planes and mostly uh, dive bombers. And uh, I'll never forget the, uh, the courage of these pilots. And uh, I guess we, uh, most of us thought, we felt sorry. What we really thought about was the tough times that the uh, foot soldiers were having on land. 
Um, they found we had a tough because we had a lot of deep water beneath us, but uh, uh, they had the uh, dry gall, uh, uh, dry ground, and, and uh, some uh, tough opposition on land. Um, fortunately, um, about March of 1944, I was uh, selected to uh, uh, go to a, a V-12 program. Well, it was an officer's training program. So I, uh, I left my <coughs> plane in, uh, I don't recall exact day, about mid-March. Had, had a rather interesting flight, uh, flights rather, um, they, what they call the C-54 as a four-engine plane, naturally prop-driven. My first leg was uh, to Guam, changed the plane, got about 10 minutes in the air, and the uh, outboard engine and the right wing started on fire. So I turned on, came back, stayed overnight, got another plane, and then I think we flew to another island, Enuitak, changed plane on another C-54, left and got about 10 minutes in the air, the right engine on this plane caught on fire. So he turned back, waited around and got another plane, flew to um, Kwajalein, another island. Changed planes, got in the air about 10 minutes, right engine, <laughs> outboard engine again on fire. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, this this is, uh, uh, these planes were operated by what they call the ATC, or uh, Air Transport Command. Uh, well, after that episode, it flew to a long distance to what is called Johnson Island, which would be west of uh, Hawaii. Change plane, again the engine caught on fire. Outboard, the same engine, <laughs> but a different plane. Eventually got to uh, Hawaii, landed in, I don't know what field it was, uh, uh, an army field in the, in the island of Hawaii. About all I saw was from the air was, you could see Pearl Harbor, but we landed somewhere north of that. And uh, the first time uh, uh, I had any kind of fresh fruit or, or uh, fresh vegetable, Found out I couldn't I couldn't eat it except the uh, radishes and ice cream. I wasn't used to it. Our cooks were uh, uh, famous for uh, every uh, piece of meat seemed to go into hot beef stew. And if you can imagine, day after day after day in this terrific hot climate eating stew, we sure didn't enjoy it. But we uh, made made do by uh, doing a little swiping of, <laughs> of other types of food when we could. Well, after I'm leaving Hawaii, I thought this is the end. I got up over what is called Diamond Head, which is a famous landmark on Oahu by Waikiki Beach. Again, this outboard engine was on fire. Turned around and came back got another plane, and fortunately, early after many, many hours, I came to in the morning and saw the Golden Gate Bridge, and I thought, I'm going to make it. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, I had a 30-day delay in route, and, uh, and uh, then went on to uh, Princeton University for a refresher. Uh, went on to DePaul University in Indiana, at Purdue University, and then was eligible for, finally, for discharge. Uh, like I say, we weren't a real, real combat vessel, but uh, we were in the areas, and I guess I got a couple of battle stars. Probably didn't deserve it. <laughs> uh, not, not like the like the ones who were really on the uh, that served on the 
what we call the tin cans, the carriers, you know, cruisers, battleships. <coughs> I did I did see the evidence, like I say, of the, of the big shells and the pop carriers. You could, they, they were so thin-skinned that these big shells went right through them. And uh, much of our work has to do with, with uh, getting them uh, moving again so that they could uh, have, uh, get them back into combat operation. Um, well, the, by the way, the first the first episode of the Kamikaze attack was not Okinawa, but definitely in the Battle of Lake Ego. Uh, there was one one plane deliberately dived up a, into a uh, uh, what they call the floating dry dock. There was a destroyer in it that was being repaired and crashed into it. I don't know, it, it looked terrible, but I, and I presume there was a lot of, a lot of people killed. Um, I guess what I remember most, I remember, well, most about World War II is the complete unity of the American people and something to be really proud of. It's true that there were Rosie the Riveters, they were the people on the home front, and they were all so united. And boy, the school kids were too. And uh, I don't think we'll ever see this again in this country. And I was, and I was really proud that I was part of it. bank at one time and it has a few of the veterans listed on it. Now as far as my uh, service, I graduated from this school in 1943. I went to work at Davenport, Iowa for the tank arsenal and I lived there with my father until 1944 I was called into service and I was shipped to Fort Dodge, Iowa. And there was the induction center where they chose where we were to go and serve. Uh, I wanted to get into the Air Force and uh, I stumbled on a uh, rhyme that they had us repeat. And when they got the rascal ram around their own rugged rock, I goofed it. So they put me in the medical corps. I was sent to Camp Butner, North Carolina. And there, that's near Durham, is where I did my basic training. And we learned discipline, cooperation, and medical procedures to use in a field station under battle conditions. And we were attached to the 137th General Hospital, which was going over to England. There I learned to perform gastric analysis, metabolisms, electrocardiograms, which is a heart test, and uh, I was also trained to be a ward master in charge of a ward. And in June, we were shipped from Camp Miles Standish in Massachusetts, or near Boston. We went over on the USS America to Grunwick, Scotland. And from there, we were shipped to a staging area at Londino, Wales. We spent a week and a half there, and this is, next we went to Ellesmere, England, and we took over an English hospital there, and we had uh, about a thousand patients that were sent back from overseas from the Battle of the Bulge, that era. I was assigned to Ward 27, which was a gastrointestinal ward. And we had battle fatigue cases, tr trench foot cases, gunshot wounds, and the returnees were from the Battle of the Bulge. Besides, I was a ward master in these wards, and we had an extra tent for 27 people. And the one neat thing I remember about that is we had three patients, and you remember the axiom about no speak, no hear, and no see? 
with the monkeys, while well, we had that with patients. They were wounded in such a condition that they needed to help each other. And they would go to town and pitch a drunk and whatever, you know, but they all took care of themselves to come back. In 1946, after VE Day, we were brought back to the United States on the British Aquitania to New York City, and that was Camp Shanks, passing by the Statue of Liberty, and served some real food. And then they put us on straight back day coaches for 48 hours to ship us back to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. And from there, we were gave a 30-day furlough. So they tried to ship me by train to Winter, Wisconsin, which was practically impossible. They shipped me to Milwaukee and then to Ashland, and then my bus to Phillips, and then finally my mother come and got me. Uh, next, we, after that, after the furlough, we went to Camp Cyber, Alabama, which is near Gadsden, and that was a chemical warfare camp. And we did our gun infiltration and learned how to use the rifles. Even the nurses had to go through the infiltration. We were planning on finishing the war with Japan. We were being sent to China. And from there, I was deployed to Memphis, Tennessee, to Kennedy General Hospital. And I was a ward master there. And did my usual with the electric cardiograms and the other tests that I ran at the time. And from there, I was sent to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, to receive my discharge, <coughs> which is recorded in Chicago and Cook County and then went home via Camp McCoy. <coughs> I served in the 44th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron. I was inducted at uh, Illinois, and then I was shipped to Fort Riley, Kansas for my basic training. After basic training, our unit was shipped to the desert in California for desert maneuvers. It was near Yuma, Arizona very hot there. We lived in tents. We were preparing for entry into the war in North Africa. By the time we finished our training, the war in North Africa had terminated, so they shipped us to the East Coast and our station at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, or Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then at Stony Field, South Carolina, where our unit did coastal patrol for three months between Georgia on the coast, U.S. coast of Georgia and South Carolina. After that, we were shipped to uh, New York and crossed over to Europe on uh, the USS St. Cecilia, Her Majesty's ship St. Cecilia, pardon me. And we landed, our unit landed at uh, Gurek, Scotland. From Gurek, Scotland, we did, took the train to Swanage by the Sea, near the Isle of Wight on the English Channel. We trained for several weeks in, in, in England. It was windy and cold there, and living conditions weren't very uh, good. We shipped out from England at Southampton on a landing ship tank and we arrived in La Havre, France. There were three boats loaded with armored cars, jeeps, tanks, and all kinds of mechanized vehicles. We proceeded up the Seine River toward Paris, France. We disembarked at Rouen, the village where Joan of Arc was uh, uh, burned at the stake. From uh, Rouen, we proceeded in our vehicles to a little French town called Soissons. And there we camped out in the fields for several days, in the mud and rain. It was very miserable living there, before moving on through Belgium and on into Holland, at Herlin, Holland. We uh, stayed in Herlin, Holland a few days, and then they shipped us to the front lines which at that time was Geilenkirchen, Germany. We left Holland and went into the foxholes for 30 days at Geilenkirchen, and we were the farthest unit into Germany at that time. 
while we were in the foxholes over the Christmas time of 1944, the Battle of the Bulge took place, and it was just to the south of us. And the night it started, the whole sky lit up, and the bombs were falling, and we knew something big was going on. But being we were farther north, we weren't in the actual combat. But our lines got shut off, and we had no food or water for three days. For uh, to live, we had to eat sugar beets from the fields, frozen sugar beets we dug out of the fields with our bayonet, and we drank uh, or took snow for water, melted snow for water. We spent 30 days on the line at Island Karakin before we pulled back into Holland for a rest and prepared for the big push to the Elbe River, which took place later on. We proceeded uh, into Germany until we were stopped at the Rhine River. When the Russians were coming, uh, they stopped our line so Russia could come and take the Berlin and that area of Germany. Later on, in, in after uh, we did uh, patrol work in that part of Germany, and when the war ended, I was in a little town called Pina, Germany. Uh, very quaint little town. It was the town where Father Boley, the minister of the Catholic Church, the priest of the Catholic Church here, came from. And uh, later on, our unit went to Bavaria in the southern part of Germany and Nuremberg and then we went to uh, I transferred to the 6th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron and I did uh, work as a clerk typist in headquarters platoon there for several months and we entered Berlin Germany, one of the first outfits into Berlin after the war ended the bodies were still floating in the canals and the bucket brigades were cleaning up the de debris where the uh, German women were forming the, the bucket brigades because there weren't many men left around there. That's how I spent the war, war years in Germany. Prior to coming home, they sent me to three, three months to school at Biarritz, France, to the American University. Then I came back to New York and was shipped on home and I left the service in uh, April 17th, 1946 after spending a, three years, one month and a few days. Okay, I went in in uh, March of 90, 1943. And uh, had my basic training in Fort Eustis, Virginia, which was nothing but crawling in the mud, just being a boy. And uh, they took us to shoot out, taught us how to shoot a gun, put a bullet in, and pull the trigger. Oh, you're a gunner. So that that was about the training that you got. And we went to. Uh, a few other camps, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Georgia, and then we were shipped overseas to uh, Le Leeds, England. We were in a nice big Dutch uh, passenger boat. We went by ourselves, no convoy, because I had a good speed. And it took us five days, but that's because we were zigzagged. And we were in England for two months. In 1944, December, we uh, went into France, and uh, we were attached to the First Army of England. And when we were going to our destination, we were going up the Sturt Road, and we saw some guys up ahead, they were British soldiers, and they were waving us to come on. So when we got up to them, they stopped us and they said, you know, you just rolled over a landmine. 
They didn't tell us there was anything there. They just waved us out. Or you dirty dogs. And being uh, first night overseas there, I was kind of scared, you know. And then I looked over and uh, the British soldiers were over there in their camp. Lights on, having a party. So nothing was going on. I thought, boy, they're nuts. Then uh, from there we went to uh, the front lines. And uh, I was in the hand air aircraft unit that there was a half track. I had, uh, was the gunner, and uh, had two 50 caliber machine guns and one 37 millimeter cannon. Uh, well, the f first night on the front line, we had our first two casualties. A German plane came over and strafed. And one of the reasons we had the casualties, it wasn't in my uh, squad or anything, but it was in a different one, it was because the gunner was afraid to go up on the gun and shoot. So a uh, German airplane had a clear shot. But um, it changed my thinking quite a bit. And then from uh, there we went, we're getting ready to cross the Rhone River, not the Rhine, the Rhone. And uh, there was nighttime, and we were being fired on, and we were waiting to cross. And I could hear the bullets going right by me. So I thought, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to walk around the half track, went to the other side, and a bullet whizzed right by my ear. So I thought, well, I'm going to go be in back of it. And a bullet whizzed right back, back past my ear. I'm not going to get out of this, am I? <laughs> so, well, I'll leave it up to the Lord. So, uh, it turned out fine. We got across, nothing happened. Then, uh, the first night we went according to training. We uh, dug our half track halfway into the ground so it would be protected from shells. We stayed there two days, and that was work. Stayed there two days, and then we moved on. We came to the next town, and we said, that's it. So we looked, and there was a farmhouse. We went to the farmhouse, and uh, we told the people, we want this room. You can have the rest of the house. I can speak a little German, so I told him. So that was fine. And we stayed there just about a week. And we moved to the next place, and we did the same thing. And there, a couple young ladies, one of them had a birthday. So we got all our rations together, and we had a party, birthday party. We gave them flour, everything, made a cake. I'll tell you, it was rough. And as we were traveling from place to place, uh, we were supposed to be pr protecting the infantry, uh, tanks, and from airplanes. That's what our job was. And they were moving so fast, the army was, that a lot of the uh, soldiers couldn't carry all their equipment. So we would pick up uh, blankets that they left behind and everything. And when we caught up to them, we'd pass them out. And, okay, in one of these places, we're sitting there, and uh, an officer visited our section. And uh, we looked in the distance, and there was 
some airplanes. And all of a sudden, everybody starts shooting at those airplanes. And the officer says, Zahn, get up there and shoot those airplanes. I said, no, those are American planes. He's just, all those people can't be wrong. Zahn, get up there and shoot at those planes. No, I'm not going to. So he told the sergeant, tell him to get up there. So the sergeant asked me, what kind of planes are those? I told him, those are B-17s. So he didn't tell me to go up. And the officer told me, I'm going to court-martial you. I said, you'll have to do that. And the planes flew by, and they were just waving their wings at us. And he came over the radio, cease fire, these are American planes. That was the last time I saw that lieutenant. And uh, after that, we uh, kept moving so fast that uh, we ended up in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, where I had the best meal that I ever had in the Army. We, uh, when we came into Pilsen, we took over a school for sleeping quarters and that. And the captain put me on guard at the door. Don't let anybody in, you know. Yeah, yeah. Gotta be strict. So I was there standing, and uh, the woman was the wife of the caretaker of the school. He was also the brewmaster. She came out and she said, here's a chair, go sit down. I said, I can't, I'm on guard. She said, you sit down. So I sat down and she came out with a plate of mashed potatoes, sauerkraut, roast rabbit, and a big bottle of beer, the best beer I ever had. Now you eat and print, and if you want more, just say so. So I just ate there, was eating, and the captain came along. Well, Zahn, how you doing? With a mouthful, I said, I'm doing fine, sir. He says, good, keep it up. So I thought I was going to get court martial there, too. But no, he went along with it. But the uh, people in Czechoslovakia were crying on our shoulders to write to our congressmen and senators and tell them not to let the Russians come in to Czechoslovakia. Well, some of us wrote, but it didn't do any good. But that was all settled before already, that Russia was going to take over Czechoslovakia. And that was the hardest thing that I ever saw was those people crying, don't let the Russians in. Oh, back to basic training. One of the first things I learned was the difference between people. We, you met all kinds. And there was one crowd that could use foul language with every other word and another crowd that made sense. So I said, well, I don't want to be like them. I'm going to be like these guys. I want to make sense. So when I came out of the Army, I went back to school. Yeah. So, but, oh, I got al almost court-martialed once uh, before, too. When we first got over to Germany, Somehow the army lost track of us, and we didn't get anything to eat for three days. So we ate what we had on, in our knapsack, maybe a sea ration or something. But uh, that was gone on the first day, because we expected food. So I wrote a letter home to my folks. We're sitting here, and we're getting nothing to eat. 
and uh, the day after I wrote it, the lieutenant came out and he said, Zahn, what are you trying to do here? I said, what's the matter? He says, that letter you wrote, we had to censor that. I said, what for? He says, well, you can't write stuff like that at home. To whom? I said, well, why not let the people know what's going on? I says, it's the truth. He says, you write another letter like that, and you're going to get court-martialed. I says, well, you treat me this way again, and I will, I will write a letter, and then you can court-martial me. He says, well, don't do that again. But the next day, we got food. So, never two times I got, almost got court-martial. Um, and Gladys Rieger, the wife of Robert Rieger, who was in World War II. Um, he went to Winter High School and was taken out of the senior year the last couple of months to go into the service. Um, he served about four years. He was stationed in California, and um, he was in an invasion of Leyte and uh, Okinawa. Um, he had many experiences uh, um, which he didn't talk about too often. Um, but I think when he was in the service he made the best of it and he just figured he was never going to come home and, and uh, so he made the best of it. He made a lot of good friends and lost a lot of good friends, and um, I guess we corresponded all through the service when he could, but there was many months that he was unable to contact me, and we were married until after he came home from the service. Um, I still stay in contact with many of his Army buddies, some of them are deceased, but the ones that are living stay in contact with me. And um, I guess there's many stories that I could tell, but he didn't talk a real lot about it, only in a positive attitude. He saw a lot, and I think uh, maybe he erased that part from his mind. But I, when he was, we were first married, I know he used to have nightmares and that, but that passed, and, uh, and uh, he, he always thought positive, and uh, even though there was fighting and everything, I think he thought the service was a good experience for him, and um, he was very dedicated to his country in a quiet way, but uh, in any parade or anything, he always thought, honored and saluted the flag and uh, respected his country. My name is Robert Langdon from Radisson. I went in service in 1945 to 47 and I stayed in the States all the time. I didn't leave. I was stationed in Camp Lee, Virginia for a basic training and then I was discharged in 47. I come out and I went back in the service. And I went into the Korean War and stayed in the Korean, Korean War and went overseas. Fought in the Korean War. I got from 1949 to 50, 51. I got wounded January 4th. And I go home and I was in the hospital for 16 months and. So I got healed up and I come home to the churchyard. And that's about. My name is Albert Johansson. My serial number is 3626-5172. And I enlisted, was enlisted into the Army in 1941, that part of 42. 
and it it happened to be that it was the 94th General Hospital in Abilene, Texas. But it really wasn't a, a hospital. They had a hospital there, but it was a replacement unit. Whereas they trained us in everything. And so when a shipment of soldiers were moving out of the country, then if they were short two or five people, then they'd pick them up there. See? because everybody had training in a lot of things. And I did most of my uh, work in the motor pool, working on the Jeeps and stuff. And, and after that, why well, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and I couldn't pass the test because I injured my left eye, which I didn't feel good about. And uh, that's about the side of what I got to say outside of, I had the garage at Loretta for 34 years, a mobile gas station and garage. And, uh, and then I also flew from 1915 to 1970. So I did get to fly an So I owned two of them at one time. And I enjoyed the service and I enjoyed my flying very much. Uh, Carl G. Olander. Uh, I was stationed in Camp Crowder, Missouri for a whole year. And uh, I was in the mess hall, become a mess sergeant, worked there. I had seven prisoners from uh, Rommel's forces in the in desert that helped me, plus the other two cooks that I had. And uh, I become mess sergeant in just a few days because I had experience in the bakery and so forth and so on like that. And uh, that was uh, one of the things that uh, I just, uh, it was 43, and uh, it was a few few months after that when the war was all over with. The group of uh, boys that I was with in basic training, a number of them were sent to the South Pacific, and some were sent to Japan, because Japan had already given up. So uh, I would have anywhere from 100 to 150 feet, uh, boys come in at the end of the mess hall and had to feed them all. And there was morning, noon, and night, the same quantity all the time. And when we closed the place down, maybe about 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock at night, would be maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, we'd get notified that open up the mess hall. We got a troop of, of uh, fellas coming through. So we had to get everything <laughs> together <coughs> and uh, get get them to uh, feed them because they had to get back to the train, get on the train, and head west. And of course, and finally, when the war was over with, it, it was a couple of months or so, I was finally discharged, and then I went back to my dad's bakery and went to work there where I worked for 25 years later in life, which had nothing to do, but I was... Uh, uh, working on a drawing board for a number of buildings throughout the whole world. And uh, the hardest thing was when, when I, whenever we got into the metric system and that, and because uh, the metric system and our system had to be on the drawings and so and that. So otherwise that was just about my service and so forth and so on. Hello, my name is Carrie Mansbridge and this is a sheet of questions for the World War II Veterans Task to answer, and they will, um, it will be in a scrapbook in the library. My name is Amanda Granica, and this is a sheet for the World War II veterans to fill out of their memories of World War II. My name is Amy Sorowski, and after they are done answering their questions, they get videotaped, and the tape will be in the library along with the scrapbook. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Horn, and on May, May 21st, we, we will be having a party for all the veterans to honor all. Hi, my name is Jimmy Nestler. On May 20, but also May 21st, we will be showing the scrapbook and the vi and the videos. That that would also be in the library. 